fact that Zoom in particular it has a hard time connecting at the top of the hour because of the bump in network traffic. So I would say let's let's just kibitz for a couple minutes and then maybe three or four minutes after the hour, you know, get it, give, then we can jump in. That's a great idea. So um, while we're getting used to the chat feature, um, let me just try to do this poll. All right, you guys were on early. You heard me say it might be a face plant, but let's just give it a go here. Um, Ha ha, it is not allowing me to add my poll, to upload my poll. Okay, so here was my polling question. On a scale of zero to 10, where zero is low anxiety and 10 is so much anxiety you might implode, how are you? Zero to 10, zero to 10, zero, no anxiety at all, 10 high anxiety, how anxious are you? How anxious are you? All right. That's great. The first two in were sevens. Oh, we've got some low of three so far. I kind of feel like an auctioneer. Oh, I see three. Do I see three? I just saw an eight. Boy, that's the highest I've seen so far. Going down to a five, a six and an eight. Three, six. Um, so our median is north of five. Not gonna lie. Um, oh wow. <laughs> well, hi Bob. You've been thrust into the PIO role. Oh, well, there you go. Um, so yeah, Bob. Okay, so we're gonna do some breathing exercises for you at the top of the hour. Um, oh man. So inspired by this group. You know, there's that, um, that John Wesley quote, to do the most good for the most people for as long as you can. And uh, that is really the spirit that uh, I come to you with today. And, um, <laughs> you know, it's important to just see each other. You know, we need each other and we have each other, you know, and when people get anxious and people get afraid, they start to feel um, isolated and separate, right? You start to feel like, oh, this is just happening to me. But organizations like the Alliance help us remember that we're not alone. So just right now, I mean, look at us. You can, I can scroll through four screens on my Jumbotron right now. And actually, let's do this. Let's all simultaneously wave and let's scroll through our screens. Oh, the other screens don't all have, haven't all gotten the message about we want to see your faces, but holy smokes, we've got a ton of people on. We, we have each other and we need each other. Yeah. The other thing that I know for sure is that when you slow your exhales down, you downregulate your nervous system. You know, like when you go to yoga and you focus on your breathing or when you do sitting meditation, which is so much is about breathing. There's something to that, right? So I'm going to be practicing this today. I'm going to practice having slow exhales and why don't you do it too? And let's just see if we can kind of help downregulate each other on this call. Um, I'm going to jump in. I want to thank Joel and Kim for making this thing come to life. Um, I appreciate you guys so much um, and all that you're trying to do. I'm going to um, share a few slides um, for us today, and we're going to be using the chat feature quite a bit. So if you haven't already located that, it's on your, um, you know, it's on the bottom of the, your toolbar on your Zoom, uh, you know, on your Zoom uh, app. And I had encouraged everyone when they first joined in, and I'm going to extend the same thing to you. If you've just joined in, um, it would be wonderful to see your face. Uh, we humans are animals, you know, we are social animals and um, helping see your face, um, it helps us feel connected. So I'm gonna share my desktop um, now, but um, I'm gonna encourage you to toggle with your own, how you can view everybody's um, 
you know, everybody's face. Uh, so there's a speaker view, there's a gallery view. You can continue to scroll through and I want you to feel free to do that. So uh, the, the, the talk today is about how to use scenario planning during these very anxious times. We're only gonna be together for an hour. Um, I'll hang out for a little bit afterwards for those of you who wanna ask questions, but um, I wanna give you some perspective on what the hell is happening right now. And I wanna put some tools in your toolbox that can help you be a good leader uh, to others. This morning I was on a call uh, for the board of my professional association, the Association of Professional Futurists. So for many of you, the Alliance is one of your professional associations. Well, I was doing the same thing this morning, a board meeting with APF. And it's fun to hang out with a whole bunch of futurists right now. Um, but I gotta tell you, I don't think they're necessarily doing better than anybody else. You know, They're also trying to make sense of what's going on. And, this is a slide, I, I, I grabbed a screenshot from my friend Marius, he, he works in South Africa. We were trying to get our plan together of how we're gonna serve our members, but also serve the public over the next several weeks and months. And I loved uh, this framework that Mario, Marius put up and I share it with you now. You know, we're in this phase um, as the pandemic is peaking across North America um, of, helping people make sense of what's happening, right? Helping people make sense. And then we've got to move into the strategies and tactics that can mitigate what is first a public health emergency. Uh, we got to get that piece right because the economic bit is going to happen regardless. But if we can get the public health piece managed effectively and wisely and do the right strategy and tactics in the emergency response portion, we really have a chance of mitigating the economic long-term impact as well. And then can we move to vision? Can we move to creation? Um, just before we got on this call, I made a decision that next week I'm going to do uh, a free webinar. You'll all, you're all invited to it um, around, um, <laughs> around not letting the best that can come out of this pandemic be back to normal. Right. I think for those of you who do think like futurists and you can see how some of these things could play out, we have an incredible opportunity within our local communities, our counties, our cities, our municipalities, villages. We have an incredible community to act, uh, opportunity to actually fix a few things. Right. And if the best we can hope for is back to normal, I wonder if we've really done our work. So next week, I'm going to do a webinar on that very thing to help those of you who want to uh, start to think beyond the peak and into the post-peak period. So we already did this poll of how anxious you are. I think we were a little bit south of, or excuse me, a little bit north uh, of five, so a little more anxious than less anxious. That's to be expected. Uh, the pre-crisis, it's just going to continue to go up and up and up uh, with the apex. and um, it's important to keep some humor. If you wouldn't mind in the chat, what local government are you representing? I know we've got school board members on here, we've got mayors, we've got people who um, are staff and city managers, but tell, tell us where in the world you are. What local government are you, um, are you representing? And again, just you can open your chat button on your very own computer and see what folks are saying. So, I'm, doing, I'm gonna do the same. Uh, Edmonton, Idaho Falls, Manassas, Virginia, Driggs, Idaho. Um, thank you, Joel. Gridview is a great way to see loads of friendly faces. Boom. Um, what is your local government? Get that in the chat. Here we go. Joplin, Missouri, Placer County, Ottawa County, um, Wilkes Bar. Bar or Barry, I'm sorry, John. I'm you gotta school me after this man. Uh, PA, <laughs> thank you, sir. Love it. Um, SC City and County Management Association, South Carolina City and County Management Association. Hey, Kristen, Queen Creek, Arizona, Scottsdale, Arizona, Minnetonka, Minnesota. Hey, Russ. Um, okay, so we're all over the place. Um, Los Alamos County, New Mexico. The only reason I'm scanning and really trying to take a close look here is. 
because there are some of these areas where we know we have a really good guess around when you're going to peak on this pandemic and that begins to give us visibility to other things. Okay, so thank you very much. It's wonderful to know uh, where you're all from. Um, here's what we're going to do today. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to put this in some context. So I know you're in it up to your hips, your chest, your ears. It sounds like Bob, you're up to your eyeballs. Um, but we're going to put this in context because it's important to get perspective on this thing. Um, I wrote a blog about this last week, but in times of crisis, think of the X, Y axis of like control and perspective, right? And when people are in the high, high quadrant, they have, feel like they have a lot of perspective and a lot of control, they can calm down, right? They have perspective, they have a sense of control. When they're in the lower left-hand quadrant, no perspective and no control, they are in freak out mode. So I wanna help us kind of move past the, the freak out mode and think about the context of what's happening here. We're also gonna talk about scenario planning. We're gonna to work together to develop scenarios in three different zones. Um, and then finally, we'll have some time for Q&A. So let me put this, this pandemic in context first, right? You guys are, everybody who's been following the next big things knows about the certainty and impact Foursquare. You all know about this, right? Well, let's think about how high impact, high certainty events shake out in our communities. High impact events that are also completely certain are things like deaths, you know, you know what the, the social determinants of health are in your communities. Cyber attacks, increasingly, we know those are gonna happen. We can kind of count on some election meddling, seems like at this point at the national level. And we know that extreme weather events are happening with greater and greater frequency. These are high impact, completely certain events we know they're going to happen. We have to have plans in place. Then we've got those completely certain events that end up being low impact, right? So if you live in a community that has true seasonal changes, California knows when peak fire season is. Wisconsin knows when peak uh, snow season is. And you make the appropriate adjustments to staff and supplies and um, response teams and so forth. Then you've got this corner over here in the lower left that's like a shrug corner, like, meh, who cares, right? It's not certain gonna, to happen and it isn't gonna have very much impact at all. Move on, next. Then you've got these black swan events, high impact, low certainty. And I know we have at least one person on this call today who was with us at Futurist Camp last summer. And last summer, uh, we worked on a domain, the future of American democracy, and I think we did it through 2040 to give us like five election cycles. And we brainstormed black swan events that could happen. And one of our tables, one of our teams said, we foresee a pandemic that affects older white people. I was like, I was buying the older part like 100% because frail at risk population. But the white people part, I was like, heh. And they're like, well, you know, we've become so tribal right? We've segregated ourselves along so many lines. We can foresee a pandemic that would affect a, a kind of a narrow tranche of the American public. And we, we went along with it. We played along with it. I'll tell you what, two weeks ago, I texted that gal who led that table. And I was like, remember camp? Remember the Black Swan event you came up with? Um, as we're starting to see this impact of this pandemic, right? So what can we learn from Black Swan events? right, or from, from pandemics in this case. We talk all the time in foresight about, um, you know, people who do foresight are like the fire marshals. They try to sniff out where the danger is so that you never cross into it. They're the unsung heroes of, of the world because you don't know how many, uh, you know, pandemics have been prevented because there have been fire marshals out there sniffing this stuff out and getting us prepared for it, right? But firefighters are the ones who have to go in, into the emergency and face the emergency. And if we find ourselves in emergency mode, then what we know is that we haven't done a good job with foresight. You know, if we know that it's all about emergency response, then we know that we haven't done scenario planning as well as we could have. We haven't done foresight as well as we could have. These are like a trade-off, right? Um, and unfortunately, what's going to happen now, I mean, I guess fortunately is, you know how nobody buys like uh, uh, insurance or like cameras for their house until after they've had some sort of event that makes them feel unsafe, right? We don't buy flood insurance until after we've had a flood. 
this is the same thing that's going to happen. We're going to start to ramp up our investments in foresight, um, and it's going to end up being, you know, after the fact. It's just the way it goes. We're reactive. We are a reactive people. Pandemics also teach us that black swan events are real. Right, so black swan events are those things that when they happen, everyone's like, where did this come from? But in hindsight, or if you pull yourself out just a little bit, you're like, ah, yeah, you know, we should have seen that coming. The CDC had a video on its website about pandemic preparation. It put it up in 2018. I looked at it on Sunday. And it was like, here's how the CDC is prepared for a pandemic. And it covered four things, none of which are happening right now. Um, and we also know that there was Operation Crimson. Some of your communities may have participated in this, uh, at least it happened throughout the United States. The CDC did a tabletop exercise about a pandemic touching down in Chicago and spreading across the country. And uh, the New York Times was able to publish the classified internal document of all the lessons learned. And it turns out that this black swan event was anticipated and we actually knew a whole bunch of things that were going to go wrong and guess what we're living into that right now i'll put that um, in the chat i'll put that document in the chat um, so you can take a look at it so the final thing around pandemics is that um, we're so interconnected you know that something like a pandemic something like a black swan event it, our economies are so linked our people are so linked that there is a true interconnection and to think that this isn't going to touch you or your family just before I got on this webcast. The reason I wasn't, my face wasn't on a little bit earlier is because our tenant called and she said, I'm pretty sure I have it. They wouldn't test me because they're only testing the most, you know, certain cases of it, but she's exhibiting every single symptom. And we knew it was a matter of time. We know it's a matter of time before you know somebody who's in self quarantine, who's in quarantine because they're facing um, this issue right now. So uh, I feel fine, uh, but I honestly, I'm, I, you know, most of us are gonna get it at some point and uh, we've got to face into that. And then what we know is the normal stuff, the plan, plan A does not work, right? So these major disruptions require a great deal of innovation, a great deal of agility, a great deal of, um, piloting, you know, seeing what works. So great. We know about pandemics. We can see how these fall into that black swan, high impact, low certainty category, right? Okay, we're there. All right. How do we do this, Rebecca? How do we apply foresight? You've all seen the wheel, right? That there's a seven step process to foresight and it starts with framing the domain. So the domain that we've chosen is the future of our cities, North American cities, Alliance membership is in Canada and the US, the future of North American cities over 18 months. We're choosing an 18 month future for our domain because I think that's probably the amount, the amount of time it's gonna take this golf ball to go through the garden hose for all of us. So we're taking, this isn't just about your community, right? But you can take these same principles and apply it to your community. This is gonna be about the future of local government in North America over the next 18 months. So with the domain sorted, step one, we're actually gonna jump right to step 3A to forecast several plausible futures for that domain. All right, so here we go. What we're gonna do with these scenarios is we're gonna create some stories about what could happen in the future. So um, these things just have to be plausible, right? And then I want you to think about how these stories become tools that could help you, your community, rehearse for what could happen, right? Good, average, or worse. So when I think about how these scenarios could be useful for your unit of local government starting now, it comes in a couple of different flavors. Number one, it's a way for you to stress test whatever your current strategies are and whatever your rapidly developing strategies are against the possible futures. I strongly recommend when we get done with this, you're gonna have a sense of three kinds of stories for the future of local government. And whatever strategies or scenarios you guys are working on or are emerging, you wanna make sure that these are the strategies that help pull the nose of the plane up out of the worst possible future scenario and into something slightly better than that, right? This, <laughs> these scenarios also, once we start talking about them, they just help you realize like, okay, yeah, there's no going back to normal. There's no cross your fingers and throw some fairy dust. Like we got to start taking some action right now. 
And that's the final thing here is wise action. I, um, I heard a, a, a complexity scientist do a briefing uh, for a very well-respected agency. I put it on my blog uh, yesterday. I kind of gulped hard and put it on my blog. It wasn't, it wasn't classified, but it was very close to classified. Anyway, um, I put it on my blog a couple days ago and he talked a lot about careful execution and wise action. And that's one of the things I have always loved about futures work is because you have this opportunity to rehearse the future, it just helps you see a broader set of possibilities so that you can use the right tool at the right time to help the most people for the wisest outcome. So when we start our scenarios, we start with assumptions and we're gonna create two lists and boy, I encourage you to have these two lists going in your emergency response unit or whatever area of the community you work in. You need a what we know list and you need a what we don't know list. Now I'm gonna bubble up at a kind of a high level here, but here's what we know. We know that we're in a pandemic and we know the general shape of the curve under different scenarios. We have the China curve, we have the Italy curve. The New York curve is developing. We have the South Korea curve. So we have all these communities that have gone before us that are telling us the general shapes of the curves, um, you know, based on all of their different variables and their different controls. Like in China, when, the, when 800 cases were discovered, they closed down Wuhan, right? They closed down the entire city of Wuhan and they still had a spike. They got 42,000 additional medical workers to come out of the woodwork and help them with their medical emergency, and they still lost thousands of people, right? So we know sort of the general shape of this and what works and what doesn't work to contain it. Here's the other thing we know. We know that this has a link to an economic recession. I put a paper in the chat, it's a PDF, you'll have to scroll all the way to the top. But for all of you who complained in high school, like why do I have to learn algebra? This is why, so that you can understand papers about macroeconomics and the impacts, uh, links to the pandemic. So, I, and I've gone through and I've highlighted the parts that I think are very salient that you should add to your what we know list, but there are absolute things that we know about the link between the pandemic and the economic recession. And just to give you the high-low, um, on the low end, we expect 200,000 deaths in the United States based on what we know about the pandemic curve. And on the high end, 2.2 million as of the most recent data, right? That could change, the higher or lower could change. And we know that in different circumstances, depending on what your community does, we know the economic uh, shape of the recovery curve. All right, we also know that when people are afraid, they do not make good decisions, right? So we have to, as leaders, stare this fear in the face, right? And just be ready. Be ready to take action, work together, move beyond fear um, with some clear-eyed thinking. We also know that for people, there's a, an arc to how they cope right? First they're in denial, then they get really afraid and wigged out. Eventually, after two weeks, the Chinese said it kind of sheltering in place became a little bit normal. And if you're a really starry, shiny person, maybe you can even get to appreciation. I know some of you already are, right? Like, I appreciate being home. I appreciate, um, you know, time to read a book. I appreciate being able to be with my pets more. Um, all that stuff is, is what we know, right? We also know that isolation is hard on mental health. So you're probably already talking about this in your local communities, but um, for the people who already have mental health challenges, this is gonna exacerbate them most likely. And um, we're, you know, we're expecting possible increases of incidences of violence and so forth. So um, we are social animals. We're designed to be together. So putting us all in, in cages, you know, even if they're beautiful cages and we're very lucky, um, it's gonna it's gonna have a tax on us. All right. So in the chat, what else do we know? What else do we know? So this is not your speculation. This is like kind of hard fact. What do we know? It could be about your local community. Um, and I'll give you an example. Here in Madison, we know that our our health incident response team is saying April 11th will be our peak day, give or take. April 11th. We had about 20 days as of last weekend. 
So we know April 11th is going to be our, our peak day. Thank you. Um, so into the chat, please. What else do we know? Local health care resources are inadequate. Yep, most, especially if you're in a densely populated area, you do not have the beds, you do not have the equipment to be able to manage this. Um, business and employees will be impacted and will struggle into the future, absolutely. Yeah, Leslie, science will be necessary to solve this, that's right. Um, safety nets for freelancers and self-employed are, are wanting. This is revealing how fragile our safety nets really are and how, um, you know, a lot of people are, are one small hiccup away from being in trouble uh, financially, uh, you know, and now this is, this is a bigger bubble. Um, kids may be back out of school for the rest of the year. States and local governments are competing for resources. I was wondering when we were going to start to see signs of this because everybody kind of had a locked arms kumbaya last week. Um, we know that low income people are being hit the hardest. Yeah, I was thrilled about the, um, the additional $600 on unemployment insurance checks, but boy, if you didn't have a job to lose, you know, where are you if you're not just recovering, you know, getting laid off now? Rugged individual is a may not be the best ethos for building a healthy society. Joel, you've got, we've got a partner up on my, on my webcast next week. We're going to get right to that. Um, Kim, there'll be long, longer term effects beyond the peak of the pandemic impact on our communities. Yes. Nonprofits are at risk of going under. Yes, absolutely. Um, earlier this week, um, I, was with a guy from Toronto, and Toronto, as you may know, was hard hit by SARS. They were the first city outside of China uh, to have SARS, and in part because they didn't know this until after seven hours, but patient zero was in a Toronto emergency room for seven hours before they figured out it was SARS, and in that time, you know, that person infected everyone. So boom, all of a sudden, Toronto is, you know, up to its hips in SARS. And one of the things that Toronto is studying right now is how people come back from social isolation because it may very well be that the first thing people are going to do is not go to a restaurant right it might be meeting one person for coffee right it might not be going to a major sporting event right because people may have this residual sort of PTSD uh, from the social distancing uh, ben says something that we know personnel resources for coordinating between Fed and local governments are tapping the same people that are usually busy running their currently stressed out organization. You are one of those people, Ben. Uh, <laughs> elected officials are not always the best judges of what is the best response. Some are under responding, some are over responding. Thank you. Um, restaurant owners are closing shop. Yeah, this is really good stuff. Okay, so that's our what we know column. And you should have your what you know column for your current uh, organization, your current uh, local unit of government. What don't we know? Here are some of the things on my end that I would say we don't know. We don't know how long this pandemic is going to last because we don't, I mean, what we do know is uh, what sort of works to shut it down. But we don't know which states, cities, and if the federal government is gonna lift those restrictions because there's a huge risk of reinfection if things are lifted too early. Um, and there's also an opportunity to do sort of like a phased approach uh, to sort of rebuilding the economy. Those who have immunity could start going back to work already and so forth. Um, but we don't know really how long this is gonna take uh, based on response. Another thing we don't know is how deep this economic impact will go. Again, it depends on what we start to see happen. I'm willing to bet that two weeks from now, we're gonna have a much better sense of the depth of the economic impact. Uh, right now, New York has one in every five cases of coronavirus in the world. Um, so they are the canary in the coal mine and what we start to see there uh, will probably help us inform our curves. We don't know how long or deep the economic impact will last. So there are primary sectors, like if you're in Orlando um, and tourism is your bread and butter, it's gonna be tough for you. You might have a, a harder time coming back, a longer time coming back. But if you're in manufacturing, um, especially if you're in manufacturing for essential services, you're probably a little more bulletproof. And the final thing, uh, the second to the last thing we don't know is how this societal response is going to happen. A lot of us are looking now at like the, the, the aftermath of the Spanish flu pandemic. 
Um, you know, we're thinking about other like massive societal adjustments, but we just don't have a deep portfolio of things to compare this to. Um, and by the way, uh, behavioral economics aren't great indicators of this because behavioral economics are tested in much more neutral situations than this. So if you're like, oh, we just need to follow BE, oh, maybe we don't need to just follow BE because um, the stress is much different in a, in a pandemic situation. And then we, this, you know, this, I, I don't know if this law is being passed right now. It's supposed to be passed this afternoon, but this $2 trillion economic bailout who is this going to help? How much is it going to help? Is another bailout going to be necessary? There's a lot that we don't know. So now it's your turn. On your end, what else don't we know? Do you wish you had the answer to, but you just don't know? What don't you know? Oh, goodness. Yes, good one. We don't know how this is going to impact the 2020 presidential election in the United States. Yeah. We don't know the impact on staffing. I've heard some people say that people are going to be brought back part time or remotely. Um, and that's not something that economic developers are super excited about, as an example, because those aren't the kinds of jobs that they like to put numbers up for, you know, when they talk about job growth or job retention. Um, yeah, we don't know how we will continue to gather. Uh, as a community at large events, right? Well, how will mass telework change collaboration IT? Absolutely, is Zoom the future? Is this it? I had one doctor tell me um, they've been going to, they've done telework now in their health system for I think three weeks. And she said 70% of our patients can be treated via telemedicine. And she said, medicine will never be the same. So the question for us is, right, will local government work be the same? What are we learning about what can be done, what can't be done? What will be the new normal? How can we better serve our communities remotely, both staff and the public? How can we educate all children remotely when the digital divide exists? Absolutely. In some states, um, you, you can't do distance learning at the K-12 level because you have to ensure the very same opportunities for students with special needs. And many students with special needs can't use the technology. Therefore, since they can't use the technology, the general population can't use the technology. So, you know, it's a, it's a big question. Are buildings necessary uh, for student education? We don't know about this oil price situation. Uh, there's a w oil price war between Russia and Saudi Arabia. Um, right, what's this gonna do to 10 year olds today, to teens and to kids? <laughs> Potential of a cyber attack, John, you're singing my song. You know, in the military, they say, uh, when your enemy's down, kick them in the face. I have to believe that we are experiencing a raft of uh, increasing attacks on our grid, uh, on our cyber infrastructure. Um, what will impacts on socialization and culture be? Will there be impact on bricks and mortar retail versus mail order consumerism? Absolutely, that has an impact on our main streets. Will this event spark a return to science and fact-based thinking in our culture? Mayor Johnson, thank you. Um, you know, we, <laughs> many people are saying, wow, uh, Mother Nature just sent us to our rooms and told us to think about this for a little while. And she's coming back in full force. People in Wuhan seeing blue skies for the first time, birds returning where there hadn't been birds in a while. Yeah, Troy Moon, great question. What we don't know is, is this gonna make sure that everybody does have access to healthcare? Ah, Stephen Thompson, I wondered who was gonna start talking about this. Will there be a baby boom? All this working at home, y'all. I mean, really, right? Also in China, divorce rates going up. Like, wow, I had to lock myself in a house with you for eight weeks, Bye bye never again. Okay, good. So um, keep populating this chat if you have ideas because the chat's being recorded. We wanna create a little body of intelligence for the Alliance from this on the back end. So keep it, keep it humming in the chat. Um, let's talk about these three zones of scenarios, right? The Institute for Alternative Futures, our friends, Clem Beasold and Jonathan Peck, um, this was their invention. You know, we've always known that scenarios have a lower limit and an upper limit of plausibility. And they put some simple language on it, right? That in, there's the red zone, right? The zone of growing desperation. There's the blue zone, right? Which is kind of the business as usual zone of conventional expectation. Then at the top, there's that orange or gold zone of high aspiration, right? Like, man, if everything went right, uh, 
everything that could did go right. What, what, could it, what could things be like? So we're gonna do a group scenario development exercise, again using chat, um, and we're gonna work through each of these three zones. And we're gonna start with the zone of growing desperation. And for those of you who are my rainbow unicorns out there, I want you to know that the reason we do this is because people naturally freak out in moments like this. And if you try to start a group with the zone of high aspiration, all the zombie apocalypse thinking people, and there are many of us, including people in the audience, I'm married to one, right? The zombie apocalypse people cannot pay attention to the zone of high aspiration until their needs are met down here in the zombie apocalypse zone. So we start with the zone of high, of growing desperation so that we can kind of get it all out. It's important to do that, to recognize that in people. So here's the challenge question. Remember, our domain is the future of local governments in North America over the next 18 months. So in the zone of growing desperation, if things continue to get worse, more dire, what's plausible? Light it up in the chat. What is plausible? Stagnation and blighting of central cities due to business collapse. Marriage rates go down if people can't date. I love that. Um, budget deficits, no doubt about it. Service cuts, significant layoffs. I'm guessing you're thinking in the public sector. Yes, um, we could have a lot of older people die. Right now, it's interesting to see that this is all changing. I, I heard in California, it's now half of those who are being hospitalized are people under 44. So that's one thing that I should add to the don't know list. Like we've been told it's our elders, but now we're seeing a whole melt. Maybe our elders are being more careful. Um, yes, crimes against Chinese, xenophobia. Like if this gets worse, um, what does that look like? Right-wing violence, food should food shortage and supply chains. Uh, hence, people's need to hoard, right? People think about the zombie apocalypse, they think toothpaste, diapers, toilet paper, ramen noodles. Severe rise in consumer debt, and then bankruptcies further down the line. Um, Brett, thank you, combined with other disasters. Yeah, I mean, what happens? I mean, Salt Lake City already had, uh, didn't they have an earthquake? We had tornadoes in Omaha last week, in the Omaha area last week. Uh, if there are more natural disasters, which remember we said we're in the high impact, high certainty quadrant, <laughs> if more of those happen, holy shnikes, uh, looting and riots, more severe cyber attacks on our critical infrastructure, yes, yes, yes. So there could be increasing outages just as people are trying to work from home, um, neighbors turn upon neighbors, you know, when people are buying guns and ammunition, you have to wonder what they're thinking about. Absolutely. Justification of expansion of gun ownership, reduced efforts at gun control. Victoria, thank you. Yeah, we don't know what we don't know, right? So there is that whole area of, oh, you know, we've got it. That's why we have to keep these lists going. What we know, what we don't know. And then the more things we'll move on to the what we don't know list. Increased illness in other areas due to medical system stress. Yeah, how long does it take a health system to bounce back from something like this? The system is the building, it's the doctors, it's the equipment. Um, what does that look like? Citizen frustration with local government response. Lack of revenue leads to infrastructure collapse. You guys are really good at the zone of growing desperation. I think my heart rate has gone up a couple beats. Um, okay, keep a comment if you've got more to say about the zone of increasing desperation. But for everyone else, let's come up here to this kind of more business as usual situation. Here's what I mean by this. Um, Galveston, Texas, right? They've been through Ike, they've been through Katrina, they've been through an oil spill. They're looking at this and they're like, we, this feels familiar. You know, we have done emergency response before. Maybe not exactly like this, but you know, we've done emergency response before. We've been through the Great Recession where a huge economic stimulus package was released. It's not the same as the one we're looking at today, but it's, you know, we've gone through these cycles before. So if you are gonna estimate for local governments over the next 18 months, What's plausible if we sort of stay in the zone of conventional expectations? How do local governments normally respond in times of stress, in times of urgency? Go ahead and put your ideas in the chat.
the zone of conventional expectations. What's plausible over the next 18 months in the zone of conventional expectation? Fantastic. Increased public-private partnership. Yeah, we're going to take the lessons we learned from the last time and we're going to say, here we go, you guys. We got this. Let's start planning now for the recovery. Absolutely. We could just retrench. Right. So again, how do we buy out our older workers? You know, how do we reduce costs? What are the kinds of things? How can we use this crisis to help us do the things that would kind of be helpful anyway? Um, yeah, we could invent a vaccine for COVID-19. Um, more regional collaborations. We could come up with new models for business operations. More effective and efficient delivery of CERT. We all go to priority-based budgeting. Lori, Kim says, focusing on essential services for local governments, like do, just kind of getting back to basics. Reduced park programming, um, clear communication to communities, halted innovation of uh, social impact efforts. That's also very true. You know, we know that when we go through these things, we kind of cut all the things that don't feel absolutely essential. And, and that does have some impacts, but that is in the zone of conventional expectation. Brett, I love that you wrote this in here um, about new respect for the value of government, because that's actually what I want to pivot on to talk about the zone of high aspiration. Now, I'm just gonna tell you something. I've been talking about this, these future zones for 10 days straight with nonprofits, with local governments, with insurance companies, with risk pools and so forth. This is the zone where everybody lets me down, the zone of high aspiration. But I told myself today when I was getting ready for this webcast, the Alliance is not gonna let me down. These are the people who know how to innovate. So I want you guys to bring it here. What could the next eight, what's plausible in this time period if we you know, could kind of live into the gold zone, the zone of high aspiration? And if you need a hint, these aspirational futures often are started by either a top-down approach, you know, like a tremendous leadership that really kind of takes command and control uh, of the situation and does the right things in the right way at the right time with the right resources, or it's bottom up where it's like super citizen led and like all these things emerge that you didn't even know you needed, but citizens work together and figured it out. So if, you, if you're having a hard time in the gold zone, here you go. It looks like you're not having a hard time. Um, in the, so John Stevens, we're gonna lie with big climate change policy and start practicing implementation. Uh, local governments start to execute proactively. Amazing art will emerge, yes. Artists' voices have never been needed more than now. Um, neighborhoods are going to start to reconnect. Maybe we're going to start to rebuild porches on the fronts of our house, not the backs of our house. And we're going to face each other instead of facing away from each other. Will technology flatten these traditional hierarchies? And, and will innovation be coming from more places? Civic engagement could increase significantly. People start showing up, maybe out of appreciation, as my friend Brian said, for our public sector officials. Wouldn't you love it if on the first day that you head back to City Hall, citizens are outside your door clapping for you, thanking you for all that you've done? I can see it in my mind. Okay, uh, hoping for new respect for planning, which could extend to community planning, better, more creative online learning. Yes, this could be education's moment. Um, young people start stepping up even more to lead to like, move aside older people, like we got this. Um, healthcare for everyone all the time. Julie, citizen participation in government it could be easy it could be flexible um, a new appreciation for expertise from pre thank you um, Mike Sable the way that we talk about the value of government and how help use that to redefine service expectations uh, respect and empathy for our earth and each other new reliance and technology green new deal to rebuild the economy uh, Mike thank you it truly marks the end of winter Focus on strategic planning as a must-have, not a nice-to-have. Yeah, that's it. Um, you guys have not let me down. Appreciation, appreciate the value of people doing service work, greater capacity for dealing with the unpredictable. All right, you guys have given me a lot of really good fodder. Keep it coming. Uh, increased tolerance for ambiguity and uncertainty. You know, I can kind of see that, Katie, because I think, um, you know, all of us, I, I think, all of us who live through this, which will be most of us, um, I think all of us are going to look back on this time. I mean, COVID has frozen some things in place, 
right? And has just kicked so many of us into a new reality that um, I think we, we could have more patience for ambiguity um, to slow down and do deeper thinking about some things. Um, man, I hope so. I really hope so. Regeneration of nature and natural processes. Oh man, Lori, this is an interesting implication. Getting real about addressing mental health. Yes, because I think, uh, you know, look at what's, people have been sheltering in place in New York now going on week three, climbing the walls, uh, ha you know, having difficulty realizing how difficult it is. Um, and that gives us just more empathy for those who struggle with real um, mental health, mental health diseases. So yeah, that absolutely could happen. Okay. You have not disappointed me. Thank you, Alliance for Innovation. Um, now, let me actually, let me back up just for a second. So we think about these futures in three zones. So I, I hope you're already thinking about, okay, how do you take this back to your team? First of all, what do we know? What don't we know? If there are things that we don't know, and we must know them, and maybe they're knowable, you have to deploy some resources to figure those things out because they help you manage the uncertain moments. So takeaway number one, what do you know? What don't you know? Move on. Takeaway number two, the future is not just an outside in, the future happening to us. We also happen to the future. So it's not just, um, you know, oh, you know, we're the victims of whatever the next 18 months will bring. You in large and small ways will help shape whether we end up in the zone of growing desperation, in the zone of conventional expectations, or in the zone of high aspiration. And God, I'd like to think that because we spent a little bit of time today, I would hate to see any of you get into the zone of growing desperation. We got to pull the nose up. Um, so that's another takeaway is to help your team imagine what these plausible futures could look like. So in your own lo local government, your domain is your local government and you choose the time period. Some people are choosing six months for their domain. Some people are choosing end of the year, December 31st. Some people are looking you know, through the next fiscal year. You choose what's gonna make sense for you based on local conditions, right? But to think about the future in these three zones. And here's the bonus point. What are the, oh, sorry, I've gotta go through this whole thing of builds here, unfortunately. But here's the bonus is then what are the tripwires that would indicate that you've gone from a red zone scenario into a blue zone scenario or from a blue zone scenario into a red zone scenario. This implications wheel is a tidy way of just helping you map some of these things out, right? So in the center is the event that happens. Maybe it's a policy that you or your mayor or your city council passes, right? Your city, man city manager, right? So maybe it's a policy. Then you got to think through the second and the third order implications because some of those implications may tip you into another zone. So the easy example, the really easy example is um, at home right now, right? We are working at plan A right now around our finances, but knowing that cash is really important, we want to stay very liquid. So, you know, we're, you know, we're deferring things that we can defer. Um, we are not hoarding, um, but you know, we're being frugal. We're being very frugal and we're operating in plan A. If one or both of us loses our income, right, then we immediately, that's an event, that immediately puts us into plan B, right? And then you start thinking about, okay, what are the implications of that? So that you are always ready with what the very adaptive and agile response should be. So what are the tripwires that would take you from a plan A to a plan B to a plan C? And as you know, these can change within an eight hour period. Some of you are living entire weeks in an eight hour period in one workday. So this implications wheel is just a really um, intuitive way for you to think through, okay, if this happens, then what? And then what because of that? And then what because of that? So a quick debrief. Um, I would love to know from you um, in the chat would be great. What's been useful to you from this presentation? What worked? What worked in this presentation?
the zones were good, the stages, thinking about knowns, unknowns. Good. Yeah, Leslie, I agree. It's nice to hear from others. Good. Yeah, good. Would like to know more about how to reduce anxiety, stress. Good, good. Um, yeah, yeah, how to think about events, right? Evaluation of events. How does how are things working? Um, Joel, awesome. Glad that you like the chat as a comms tool. I didn't know how people felt about it either, but the feedback I'm getting is I think people just like to, they would like me to shut up. Not necessarily in this webinar. You guys are all too polite to say that, but people love seeing everybody else's uh, chat. It is awesome. Um, yeah, John, we, we interacted without speaking to each other. Um, yeah. Oh, Wendy, this is a beautiful understanding as well. Realizing that I'm a hopeful idealist and I need to help move people out of the zombie zone. I'm the same way. And I, sometimes I want to believe that the zombie zone doesn't exist, but it does exist. And if we don't help people process it, they cannot even think, uh, often about anything better because the worry just becomes, I mean, it's because of the way our brains work, right? Whatever we feed our brain, our brain's like, huh, what, what else in my environment feeds that? So as you get on those anxiety loops, that's what's happening, right? The way that our, our neurons wire and fire together, uh, we look for more things to reinforce whatever um, emotion we're having. I mean, you know this, if you've ever been mad at somebody, all of a sudden you think about 15 other reasons to be mad at that person. None of them are relevant in this moment, but it's your, your wiring, your neurology. So it's hard for us if we're zombie zone to think about aspirational zone and the reverse. Um, and if there are things that you would, you would like to know more about, um, I would love to know that as well. Um, I've got time for questions. I've got a little bit of time for some questions, and then I'm going to let you know about this upcoming webinar, and then we're going to go done. So um, I'm going to put, I'm going to just keep the chat open for any questions, but Joel, Kim, um, Brandy, if you guys are on from the Alliance or any of the Alliance board members are on, if there are some very specific things that you think, you know, you want to ask on behalf of the members, you've got a good sense of Alliance members, what would they want to know about or what should we spend a little more time talking about? Oh, first off, Rebecca, I just wanted to, to thank you for, for this work. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering how we can make a, a kind of Russian nesting doll set of scenario responses so that so we, we have our, our team, our department, our organization, our community, and, and so on, and how we can use these to, to one to inform the other. Uh, have, you, have you seen kind of examples of that building out from, from smaller to, to larger? Yes, I'm working on a project right now with a client who um, they also serve uh, local governments in a, in a different way than you guys do. And they're asking people to think first about the end client. Like, and, and for them, the end client is you. It's local governments, right? So what are our clients experiencing? We've got a, that's the first part of the Russian nesting doll, right? And if we have a sense of what future zone those clients are moving towards, then we know how to put um, some structure around them that would be really useful, but their needs could set us into one of the three zones. So that's where the Rus Russian nesting doll is coming from. So I think um, if you wanted to apply this for local government, right, it would first be like, what are we anticipating from our residents over the next d period of the domain, right? And if we can agree on, if, we're, if they're gonna be in the desperate zone, the expectable zone or the high zone, what is the appropriate response from each unit of local government? Like how do we um, wrap around those folks in a way that's useful, but also help keep the nose you know, up so that what are the things we can do to prevent our residents from going into that zone of growing desperation? And I would kind of go from there. So I would do citizens first, then maybe by department, then maybe overall for the city. And then the city can like be thinking about, okay, could we bring regional partners into this conversation? Could we bring states into this conversation? That's how I'd think about it. Uh, um, somebody asked earlier, and I'll come to some of these other questions. Um, somebody asked about perspective and control. And um, 
here's what I would say. In times like this, all of us who have influence over our departments or our cities, our residents, it is our job to provide perspective and control. It is like, I feel like, I feel really passionately about this. Like it is a moral obligation to comfort people. It is a moral obligation to give them perspective and control. And here are the ways we give them perspective. If you think about how you define, how we define perspective, like artists would say, you know, perspective is something that artists study, right? So if you draw something closer to you, it's bigger. If it's in the foreground, it's bigger. And if it's further away from a perspective control, it's smaller, right? So right now, coronavirus feels like this. It's right here. But one of the things that we can do as responsible leaders is we can zoom out a little bit and say, hey, you guys, we've been through difficult things before. I'm sure you have been through difficult things before. No, it wasn't the coronavirus. Yeah, I'll give you that. But we have been through difficult things before. So zoom out. The second thing is to remind people that human beings are incredibly resilient. We are so resilient and adaptive. And today isn't forever, right? I use this so often, but this really is like that golf ball going through a garden hose. Eventually, we will be through this pandemic. This will be in our rearview mirror at some point. So the other thing that helps give people a sense of perspective is if you can be updating them on what you know about the pandemic peak or whatever the case is or when you estimate that you will be out of it, give them some perspective because they want to feel like things are adding up and that they're moving towards something, right? So that's another way to give them perspective. Zoom out, right? Tell them that we've been through difficult things before and also remind them that you care about them. People who are working from home right now, I mean, especially parents of young children, are climbing the walls because they're now having to be a teacher, a full-time daycare provider, and they feel incredibly called to do this work. So I met with a CEO yesterday. He said, I've told people that we're working midnight to midnight. And he's like, and that's not because I expect people to work 24 hours a day. It's because I expect them to take care of their families first. And if they can, get their work done at odd times to do that, you know? So pull out the pins on people and give people a sense that we can expand time right now. We don't have to stay in these like little boxes. Again, give them perspective, zoom out. How do you give people control? You give them something to focus on. You give them something to do that they can focus on and that naturally reduces people's anxiety. Um, you know right now that there are a lot of people who are stress cleaning and stress baking uh, and stress exercising. I mean, why are people doing these intensive activities? Because they can and they need to do something, right? People need to do something. So um, an easy way to do this is what is your daily ritual or routine around your stand-up meeting, right? So if that's an 8 to 8.30 a.m. or a 9 to 9.30 a.m., but if you can, we expect you to be on the call 9 to 9.30, I, as the leader, I'm going to do 10 minutes on what we know, what we don't know, what we need to get solved in the next 24 hours. This is a time to do question and answer. And at the end, there's going to be some sort of inspiration. Like, here's something that inspired me. You know, last night I saw people clapping the medical professionals home, whatever it is, right? But helping people have those rituals in their day also gives them a sense of control. Having something to work on. I can't tell you how many people have said, we're already starting our post-COVID response. We're starting work on that now. Not because we know when it's gonna end, but because people have to have something that they can work on that can capture their attention, capture their focus, feels proactive and feels hopeful. So those are a couple of ways to give perspective and control. Um, yeah, Bob, me, me too. I'm sorry as well. Um, and in light of what I just learned about my tenant, I don't think I'll be seeing you for a few weeks. Um, that's right. Stay healthy, stay well. This too shall pass. Um, yeah, any tips for encouraging management staff to consider scenario planning more seriously? Here's what I would say, Julia, is um, I've typed up, it's on my blog, I've typed up like how to do this. Use it. Uh, use the slides. You know, Joel is recording this. This recording will be available at the Alliance website. Use this narration to do the very same process for your people. Maybe put it on 2x so that you don't have to hear my voice as much, right? But this process is possible uh, for anybody. Call me. If I can help you, I will, I will definitely help you, right? Um, yeah, so that's that. Um, all right, it's time for me to go. 
Um, my next free webinar that's going to be available to the general public is going to be called something like we can do better than back to normal. And it's going to cover, some of you know this tool called causal layered analysis. Um, it says that how we tell, you know, how we frame our worldview tells us the results that we get in our community. So how do we use narrative to guide our recovery, fix problems, and help communities really live into their potential? So how do we take this moment and link it to some of the bigger systematic issues that we know need fixed? That's what my next webinar is gonna be. I haven't, I just decided before I got on this call I was gonna do it. Um, so if you would, just add your email to the chat. I'll make sure you get the notice about it, or Joel can announce it to you. If you don't wanna give me your email, that's cool. But um, if you wanna attend, it'll be free. It'll be sometime next week, and I'd love to see you there. Joel, back to you. Fantastic, this, this is the perfect example of putting the Alliance in Alliance for Innovation. Uh, and I'd like to, to thank Rebecca for this, uh, you know, amazing work. It, it means so much to me personally, and I, I know to, to the rest of you. I'd also like to extend the invitation to, what is your specialty that you'd like to add to this? What, what, is, what do you want to put in the stone soup that we're all cooking together here? Uh, Alliance is, is, as you might imagine, putting together a whole COVID response toolkit and, and suite of services. If you have something you'd like to add to that, please let uh, Kim or I know, or, or any Alliance member. Uh, we'd love to add your voice to the chorus. But other than that, uh, Rebecca, just warms my heart to see your face and, and this message. It was just complicated enough that I liked hearing it again for a second time and, and making more detailed notes. Uh, and I look forward to, to not only taking our team, but a, a, a number of Alliance members through this process as well. So thank you again. Thank you for having the foresight to do something like this for your members, Joel. I think it helps people a lot. And thanks for your leadership. Okay, be well, all. Thank you all.